Our problem is, find the locus in the complex plane, the equation, capital Z squared equals one plus Z over one minus Z, where Z ranges over all complex numbers with modulus equal to one. First, how do we make sense of the problem? So what we do here, we're to find some z with modulus equal to one. We put it into the right-hand side of our equation, so that'll give us a number. Then we're to find, okay, the square roots of that number. So if this is equal to zero, we only have one square root. If not, then we're gonna have two square roots for our equation. Now, the way we proceed, first, we wanna solve the equation without the square. So we're just gonna look for the locus of x equal to one plus z over one minus z. How do we solve that? So I wanna introduce another variable that's gonna let us parametrize our set of points with modulus equal to one. Once I do that, we'll be able to find the locus of x. Once I have the locus of x, okay, we can forget about our parameter. I just wanna find all solutions of our z squared equal to x. And we can find those using the Moivre's theorem. First, we parametrize a set of all points in the complex plane with modulus equal to one. That set is gonna be the unit circle. To parametrize, we're looking for functions and an outside variable so that when we let that variable or parameter change, it sweeps out the set that we're interested in. So we can use z of theta equal to cosine theta plus i sine theta, where theta ranges from zero to two pi. So in this case, we go in the real direction by cosine theta, the imaginary direction by sine theta, and that gives us a point on the unit circle. Now, by Euler's formula, I can rewrite this as e to the i theta. I need a few formulas for the next board. So we have, if I take the complex conjugate of e to the i theta, we just get e to the minus i theta. Okay, so that's just using Euler's formula. We can work that out. Or we could think of it as complex conjugation reflects our points through the real axis. So if we had angle theta marking off this point on the unit circle, my complex conjugate, we're gonna to go to this point. So that's theta, that's minus theta. We also need Euler's formula for cosine and sine. Next, let's substitute our parametrization into x. So we'll have x equal to one plus e to the i theta over one minus e to the i theta. I wanna make the denominator real. So we multiply by one minus e to the i theta conjugate over itself. Now, the e to the i theta conjugate goes to e to the minus i theta. Then we can just multiply out. We apply Euler's formula. Then we'll have sine of theta over one minus cosine theta times i. Because our theta is real in between zero and two pi, sine theta over one minus cosine theta, it's always a real number. So I have a real number times i. All of these points live on the imaginary axis. Now, if you check a few points, we'll see that we're gonna get all points on the imaginary axis. So that's gonna be our locus for x. Now, when I apply the Moivre's theorem, we're gonna need to write things in the form r e to the i theta, where r is greater than or equal to zero. So we're gonna have three pieces. We're gonna have point zero. We'll have r e to the pi halves i for the upper part of the axis, and r e to the three pi halves i for the lower part of the axis. Now, a recipe for nth roots comes from De Moivre's theorem. But when it solves z of the n equals x, where n is a positive integer, x is a fixed complex number. We start by writing x equal to r times e to the i theta, where r is greater than or equal to zero. 
If r is equal to zero, we have only one solution, z equals zero. If r is positive, we have n nth roots of x. The recipe that we use for the new moduli, we're going to take the old modulus, take its nth root. For the new arguments, we're going to take our old argument, divide by n, and then add integral multiples of 2 pi over n. So here what we're doing, we'll take our argument divided by n, then we're just going to add multiples of 2 pi over n until we go around one loop. So our points are going to be evenly spaced about the origin. If we draw the lines in through our points from the origin, we're going to partition the plane into n equal parts. Now, let's apply our recipe to our problem. When x is equal to 0, we have z squared equals 0, or z is 0, so we just have the origin in the plane. When I have x equal to r e to the pi I over 2, so it's the upper imaginary axis, our n is equal to 2, so we're going to send our moduli to their square roots. The new arguments are going to be pi over 4, 5 pi over 4, if we stay between 0 and 2 pi. Now, because we have all positive moduli, we're just going to get the line through the origin at a 45 degree angle minus the origin. Similarly, for the lower imaginary axis, we're using the angle 3 pi over 2. So out of here, we're going to get the angles 3 pi over 4, 7 pi over 4. We're looking at the line y equals minus x minus the origin. Putting everything together, the locus of our original equation is given by these two lines. Of course, we check our work. So we'll take some points from the unit circle, put them into the right-hand side of the equation, then take the square roots. The check is those square roots wind up on one of these two lines. Now, if we try z equal to 1, the right-hand side is undefined. So that won't contribute anything to the locus. If I use z equal to minus 1, we have big Z squared is equal to 0. And that means the unique square root is z equals 0. That gives us the origin on our locus. If we use z equal to i, big Z squared will be equal to i. The square roots are going to be plus minus square root of 2 over 2 plus square root of 2 over 2 times i. We get the two points marked with an a. If I use z equal to minus i, then we'll have big Z squared is equal to minus i. The square roots are going to be plus minus square root of 2 over 2 minus square root of 2 over 2 times i. They're marked off in our picture where the b's are. Okay, note if we want to check these roots, we just square them and see that minus i comes out. 